This is Basket Case Clubs, CPR Group's podcast where we turn basket case clubs into showcase clubs. Hi everyone, welcome back to Basket Case Clubs. I'm Michael Connolly and it is once again my pleasure to be your host on our journey of basket casing goodness and joining me again is Steve Connolly. Welcome Steve. Hello everybody, hello Mick, glad to be back. I was going to say, living in the analog world today. Look at us. We've got notepads, both of us, and pens. No digital devices in front of us except those which are recorded. Yeah, that one right there. Yeah. I was going to say, how are you this fine day? But you can see out the window that it's a bit crappy. It yeah, is a bit there. crappy. Yeah, the rain shine coast. Well, we did it? just capture, though, in the bottom of our um, screen a happy old person riding past on their bike. So they're making the most of the limited sunshine. Yeah, it's a bit of sunshine out there, as I can see now. Yes, yeah, nice. Anyway. Uh, I have not what we're here to talk about. Not what we're here to talk about. And I have a bit of a sombre starting oh. point today. Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh, so I'm off to a funeral this afternoon, and every time you go to funerals, you kind of get a chance to evaluate your decision making paradigm. <laughs> you think to yourself, so when I'm on my deathbed, am I going to be happy with all of the decisions I made mm-hmm. and the the places that I put myself? and the opportunities that I capitalized on and how I spent my time. Mm -hmm. And it got me thinking, I know a lot of volunteers who can probably look back on their volunteer experience with fond memories, but there are certainly some who at some point in their volunteering journey have literally cracked the shits and said, you know what, enough's enough. I'm not enjoying this anymore. Mm -hmm. So what I want to talk about today is volunteer burnout and what causes it and what we can do about it. And it is a sad reality that we work pretty frequently with volunteers who are either approaching or have already achieved, surpassed. Achieved kind of makes it sound like a positive thing. <laughs> achieved <laughs> burnout. Yeah, achieved. Yay! Yes. Good, on, good on us. We're but we do. Burned out. Yes, we're winning. We work, yeah, we work with it. Yeah, not, not that sort of burnout. Yeah. We work with a lot of people who even go through phases of satisfaction or lack thereof in their volunteer role. Yep. And unfortunately we work with a lot of volunteers who sometimes will be wanting to take a step back, but haven't necessarily done all that they could have through their term in office or in their role to be finding suitable successes, suitable people to replace them. And successors, not successors. Successors, yes. And that's certainly one of our, fundamental principles of succession is that it should start when you start in your role. It shouldn't start when you want to get out. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But, uh, but, and this is, this is how I wrap up a lot of my discussions, whether they're workshops or just meetings with boards and committees. And that's to point to that finite amount of time that all of us have got on this earth. And you're right that funerals are a really somber reminder that, that we've all got an end coming at some stage. Hopefully it's uh, some way away. But it's up to no one other than ourselves to choose how we spend that time. And unfortunately, we do often also work with volunteers who are spending their time in a really shitty way. Yeah. Really, you know, manual tasks, not not So lack of efficiency. Lack of shitty. There's there's no... Doing things the same old. Absolutely. Doing things the same old way. Just because that's how the previous, you know, several treasurers... Generations of volunteers. Yep. Yeah. So that really leads to a very important point, which is how do we get into a situation where we're experiencing burnout in the first place? Mm -hmm. And the really sad reality is, as you've touched on, we are where we are in life purely because of the choices we have made. So now the funeral that I'm going to this afternoon is, is not linked to volunteering. It just got me thinking how do I want to be remembered? Mm. How do I want to feel at the end of my life? Do I want to feel that the time that I have spent as a volunteer has been well valued? Or do I want to, of course I don't want to feel, but so many people are going to feel that the time that they spent was just purely transactional, Yep. that it didn't add any strategic value to their organization. And they spend a lot of time just getting on the hamster wheel and just doing the doing. That's naturally going to happen because when we see the the hamster wheel going, we go, well, that's how it works here. And we just jump on board. And I've seen really, really clever people, people who are entrepreneurial and fantastic and creative and innovative in, uh, in their work life, 
but then they don't bring that to their volunteer life. They say, oh, that, that's how it's done here. And they just jump on the hamster wheel. The reason that, that, so that's one reason that the hamster wheel is already spinning and it's easy to jump on, you know, yeah. the old saying, what's the easiest direction to ride a horse is the direction that's already going. Yeah. So they just jump on and they just, they just do it because they don't have to spend any time. They don't, sorry, they don't have to invest any additional time in changing the system or making things better or making things more strategic and sharing some of the transactional duties across the board or even systemizing a lot of those transactional duties out of the workflow altogether. But a, a massive a massive part of it is that when they decide to do that, they're deciding to do that. They don't have to jump on that hamster wheel and keep doing things the same way. They do have the ability to, to make a different decision and take a different direction. But then we, we weigh up our time and we say, well, you know, Chris is now eight, turning nine. There's a good chance that he's not going to be playing football beyond 11. So my days are numbered. Do I really want to be spending some of my time recreating a system that's not going to benefit me. So if the yep. additional time it'll take, I'm not going to benefit from that. So I'm not going to put in the energy to do it. And then a new person comes along and is straight back at the beginning of their hamster wheel journey. And a lot of that sentiment happens, I think, subconsciously between the years of the volunteers who are doing the work. So this is oh, not yeah. to be critical of those people, which I think is an important point to make. But the other thing that I know I harp on about quite a bit is that getting on the hamster wheel and doing things the same way that generations of people filling that same role before you have done them is the path of least resistance. Whether people consciously or subconsciously are uh, guided in their actions by this, you know, making change, particularly where we're talking about investing money, club money, to save volunteer time. And, and again, I acknowledge that this is something that I do harp on about a bit there, in my experience, is often real resistance to that amongst volunteer committee members because they value everyone else's time. They value the club, you know, subconsciously more importantly than their own time. They value it at a higher rate. Therefore, oh, I couldn't spend club money to save me some time to do this more effectively or quicker. And therefore, the likelihood that we're working towards burnout, and that leads to frustration too because let's face it, the ways of doing business today are very different from the ways of doing business even two years ago. Fast forward to two years from now with the you know rapid um, onset of uh, AI, 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 AI or the, general, up, the uptake of AI the uptake, and its influence on our workflows more broadly. Absolutely. In the efficiencies that we can achieve, the the opportunities to save time and therefore arguably to help avoid burnout are only going to grow as time goes on yet the rate at which the uh, appetite for taking up those opportunities in volunteer clubs i think is going to grow at a far great at a far slower rate mm. so uh, so that exacerbates this volunteer burnout problem because in our you just said in our real world in our real life rather we've got people who are you know running successful businesses they're you know efficient in their delivery of uh, tasks at work and then they come into their volunteer role and they got to do shit the same old way that's going to piss someone off whether they actively recognize it or not because they're getting some intrinsic uh, value from doing that volunteer work. So they're going to get some enjoyment out of it and that enjoyment might last for some time. But it's also very likely that it's going to get to the point where they say, oh my God, why am I doing things so slowly? And why is this taking an, an unnecessarily large amount of my limited time? Sometimes it's only a matter of people being alerted to the fact that they don't have to take that much time. So what other... What what other things can be a catalyst or an impetus for change then? Obviously, sometimes and this is a, a job that we fortunately or unfortunately get to play. We can come in as the outsiders and we can see the real situation. We can see the people who are at risk of burnout. We can see the people who yeah. are feeling burdened by the victim mentality that it's all being put on me and I have to do this, I have to do this. But you never have to do it. And what I'm talking about this decision is we get to a fork in the road we can say, okay, so I'm already doing a whole heap of work and some of those are my job. If I'm a committee member, for instance, so if I'm secretary, then organising meetings and taking minutes of meetings and producing those minutes and circulating those minutes, managing communications and doing some reporting, so compliance reporting, those are all part of my secretarial job. Then somebody else comes along and says, hey, Michael, you and the committee should do this. I've got this great idea for you and the committee. And I go, 
Okay, and I and I make a decision, and uh, there's a choice here, and I call it a, a very quick worst case consequence analysis. So I can say, okay, what's the worst case if I take this job on? The worst case if I take this job on is it adds on to everything that I'm already doing, and it makes me feel more burdened, and it makes me feel more trapped in my role as a volunteer. That is bad. What's the worst case if I don't take it on? If I don't take it on, well, it might not get done at all. It might get done by a doofus who can't do the job as good as me. Or it, and if it doesn't happen, maybe the club will come unstuck. And I don't want that to happen. So at that point, they're making the decision that although this is going to hurt, the pain that I have to personally put up with, I am justifying to myself as being worth it for the benefit of the club. So that's the decision. And it happens all the time. And it's really a major decision because that thing that has just been lumped on me by a member who says, hey, Michael, you should... And by the way, when you get on a committee, people are going to shoot all over you. <laughs> you should do this. You should do that. You should do the other. That's really good. As, op as opposed to, you know what? I've got a job. My job as secretary is to manage meetings and manage communications and, and manage compliance. So those are really important top line, top level things that I have to do. Some of which are required by legislation. Yep. Yeah. So if, I, if I'm to take this on, what's the opportunity cost? What, which of those aren't going to get done properly or where is that extra time going to come from? And that extra time, if it can't come from those things, it can't come from my work time because I have to work because I need to get paid because I need to pay the mortgage and put food on the table. It's going to come from my personal time. And that's where we feel that burden and we feel that burden. And we, as humans, always look to externalise blame. So we will externalise blame to the people who shoot it on us we will externalise blame to the club in general. We will externalise blame to all of those lazy sons of bitches who don't do anything mm. to help the club rather than, oh, I made the decision to keep taking on these little tasks, little tasks, death by a thousand cuts. Now I'm burnt out. Now I'm cracking the shits. Yep. And now I feel trapped and I can't walk away because the club relies on me too much. And, and part of that, the, the danger in that is that it does, as we've said many times before, or can certainly become uh, a pretty integral part of someone's identity. Yeah. And yeah. that importance, that reliance upon them from the club and others within it can, can be so um, attractive, for want of a better term, that it's really bloody hard for someone to let go of. Yeah. But until they yeah. are absolutely at burnout and in some cases they say I'm at burnout or in other cases that we've experienced their significant other says either the club goes or I go. Yep. Yep. Hey club leaders, it's Michael jumping in here to ask if you've been feeling the pressure of keeping your club on track. Say hello to Club Mentor, a club's on-call partner for governance. Whenever you need advice, our team at CPR Group is here for you. Imagine having an accountability buddy for your club. With Club Mentor, you'll stay on track and hit your targets with our quarterly check-ins. Every club is unique and we get that. With decades of experience in grassroots clubs, our tailored support and advice will be just what your committee needs for peace of mind. With Club Mentor, our goal is simple, to give your volunteers more time to enjoy their roles by easing the hassle of running a successful club. There's even a package offering for councils and peak bodies. So because this is an ad now, I've got to say, what are you waiting for? Become a club mentor partner today. All you got to do is jump online and search CPR Group Club Mentor. Now I suppose I've got to say, but wait, there's more. Nah, back to the basket, Casey Goodness. So I'll, I'll come back to that because I've got to... Actually, now I'll tell you the story, then I'll come back to my question. Uh, and the question was, what is the catalyst for change? If it's not us coming in and, mm -hmm. and seeing the world for how it is, not how they're seeing it yep. through their rose-coloured glasses, what can the catalyst? What can be catalysts for change? Because we want to share that. Yep. Because if we know what the answer can be, then that's how we can help. So let's leave that as a takeaway. But the, so I'm going to change their names. So I'm going to call them Paul and Paulina. <laughs> as two members of a committee in a club that I work with. I won't even tell you the, the sport, just in case. So we're in a meeting and there, there are a few of us in the meeting and we were going through this. So this was interesting because it was a strategic planning project, not a counselling session, but it didn't stay a strategic planning project for very long. It really, really turned into a counselling session. 
and we had been around the room and we had some people who were sharing some stories that, that they'd never shared before. They were really laying it out there and they were really expressing the pain that they were going through and the fear of feeling trapped for the rest of their lives. And it got to Paul. Now, Paul... Just quickly, was there quite a bit of uh, consistency in the room in terms of those feelings or were some people really at one end of the spectrum and others were surprised to hear that? Consistency in feelings, but it, it took... It, it really took me rattling the cage to say there's something going on here and I, I can sense it because I can see the looks in people's faces mm. and I can see the bags in people's eyes getting bigger and bigger yep. over time. Yeah, okay. The reason that people got into the situation was different, but okay. there was consistency in the feeling. So and the Good. reason that people drove right. themselves into it, but then for them to realise, it's probably the session where there were the most tears in the one session. Okay. Because normally we will, when, when people come to the realisation that they are the master of their own destiny, the tears that they cry are not the tears of regret, which you think they could be. You yep. think I'm regretful because I'm getting closer to my time on my deathbed where I get to review this. Mm. So they could be tears of regret. It is tears of realization that I am in control of my life and yep. I have the ability to now change the way that I make all of those decisions from now until yep. my volunteering journey ends, which by the way, could be right now. Mm. It's, it's just that awakening. There's an old saying that I love. It The internet says it's attributed to Confucius, but, you know, when we're at school, Confucius used to say all of those things. Like, mm -hmm. Confucius say, don't piss in the wind or you'll get wet. <laughs> so I don't, I'm not going to piss in the wind. Sure. <laughs> I'm piss in the wind. Thank you, Confucius. But I'm also not going to make, I'm also not going to say for sure that okay. it's Confucius. He says, uh, everyone has two lives. The second one begins when you realise you only have one. <laughs> That's powerful shit. That's really powerful. And that's like, I still get goosebumps when I say that and I go, oh my God, I, I can't undo this. Yeah. I can't go back in time. I I only have one life. Yeah. So on a, like I said at the start, on a day when I'm contemplating mortality on the way to a funeral, this is the sort of stuff that we need to consider mm. in our industry. So, And empower our, our clients. Our clients, our clients yeah. 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 So Paul and Paulina, so Paul, it got to Paul and Paul was sharing his feeling of being trapped. So as... Were Paul and Paulina a couple or were they just coincidentally named? Spoiler alert, yes, they were. Sorry, we can go yeah, back and... Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's okay. We can, we can, give, that, we can give that away because it was <laughs> going to come out anyway. Um, and not their real names. So, you know, the coincidence of them being named something similar. Yes. <laughs> it's just You're crazy. Wave wow. that up. Wait, wait. <laughs> So Paul would at, it would do his job as, I think he was senior coaching coordinator, okay. as well as a coach, as well as treasurer. Right. So there's a lot of jobs busy, going on busy person. here. Yep. Now, because nobody else was doing the social media for the club, Paul took it upon himself. Okay. Every day. Working a full-time job and a coach and a coaching coordinator and a treasurer meant that the time that he was able to commit to doing all of the social media posts. Yep. And by the way, when you say I'm, I'll be social media coordinator, oh, just share, share your stories with me and I'll, I'll, I'll pop them up on the club's Facebook page or whatever. Who shares their stories? No one. Mm. So Paul's following people around, yep. so yep. staying back late at coaching, taking that's even photos, worse asking than, for the stories. That's even worse than chasing fees. Yeah. Chasing, <laughs> chasing social <laughs> media articles. Yeah. And... So he was then telling the story about feeling trapped because it was every night and it was okay. not till after 11 that he was getting to bed every night. Now, to go back to you spoiling the story, Paulina is Paul's wife and that was the first time that anyone but Paulina realised that this marriage was at risk of breakup because she then admitted, I go to bed at whatever time at 9 30 10 o'clock i've yep. got to go to work as well and never ever ever does he come to bed with me he stays up doing stuff that nobody gives a shit about Paulina's is not a swearer but she swore nobody gives a shit about it paul you stay up late and i there's nothing i can do and then i go to work early we we pass like mm. skips in the night we never get to spend any time together and it's all because of this club yep. and you making a decision to keep doing that. So more tears and more realisation, but I'm happy to report that they're still happily married. You know, when the change started, 
Hopefully immediately. That day, before yeah. that meeting f- had finished. Yeah. But so, and this is why this is so powerful. And we, we, like I've said, I don't think I've said it on the podcast, but I, I gave up working with clubs decades ago. Mm. I work with people because it's the people who make great clubs. Yep. So what we need to do is now look at what the realisation can be for anyone who's listening, for anyone who is feeling or who has felt volunteer burnout and is now at that point where they've realised that they've only got one life and it is entirely up to them to make a change, what can the impetus or the catalyst for change be? Okay. Interestingly, I made a little note before you told that story, which I've not heard before, and it relates to the importance of others on the management committee or within your volunteer team holding each other to account. So what I assume is that part of the reason that Paul and Paulina are still married and part of the reason that they will have been able to stick to their guns in making meaningful change in how they were spending their time is that others on the committee will have had less of an idea how much of an impact their behaviour, their choices to do that volunteer work was having on their marriage. So whenever anyone else senses now that they're slipping back into old habits and that they see Paul posting on social media at 11 o'clock at night, that they check in with him and say, mate, we agreed that you weren't going to do this anymore. And I'm speaking from personal experience here because I know that you and I sometimes need to hold each other to account. We need to you know, hold our staff to account and make sure that they're looking after themselves because we've got a bunch of people who really give a shit about the work that we do and the the help that we give to the people that we support in clubs across the country. The marriages that we might inadvertently keep together. That's not our job. Absolutely. If that's an outcome. That's a win. That's what gets me out of bed on a Monday morning. Yeah. So so I think that that's, that's a really important um, point that I noted down in terms of that catalyst the catalyst for change is holding one another to account and having a really open discussion as a management committee about the importance of avoiding burnout. Because let's face it, if a volunteer burns out and they leave their roles that they're filling, then that's going to have a detrimental impact on the club. So it's not good for the person. It's not good for the club. It's not good for the other volunteers. So it's actually in everyone's best interest to avoid that situation becoming a reality. So that's watching out for each other. Yep. So as far as the catalyst goes, I think that's great. I think it's second. And the most important one is just have a look in the mirror. Yeah. How much time you're spending volunteering and what's the real value that it's bringing. Yeah. Then the other one can be systems. So what systems do we have or not have that could reduce the time? And you mentioned something really important before. Clubs can spend a little bit of club money yep. to save a lot of volunteer time. Yes. And those clever people, those innovative, entrepreneurial, creative thinkers can be the same people who become completely blind to the value of their time when we're just volunteers. Yeah, Volunteering should be priceless, not worthless. Yeah, And that's exactly how we're seeing it. If we say, oh, let's not spend money on that new uh, developing a CRM. I know that with competition management systems and membership management systems, we've got access to data, but it's not a CRM. Mm. It doesn't track our, the R in CRM is relationship, our customer relationship management system. To have a customer relationship management system can mean that we don't need to be keeping scraps of paper or going and checking through old emails because we've got access to it. We can drill in and say, let's have a look at, at who this, that can save time using better accounting systems can save time. But the time that is saved, so in the transition from manual accounting to automated online accounting systems Mm. can save conservatively 20 hours a month. Now, if you've got to pay 60 bucks a month for an accounting system that saves you 20 hours a month, that is a no brainer. The only, and I told this story recently of uh, of a treasurer who cried when I explained, no, no, you, you're allowed to use zero, because when I'd asked why she's still doing the accounts manually, some grumpy old fart of a stupid prick of a life member sat in the front row of the AGM and said, no, you can't use that zero thing. No, no, because it's in the iCloud. It's in the iCloud and the iCloud gets hacked. Remember those those famous people who had their nerdy pick? No, we can't have our club accounts on the web. She, she was a bookkeeper by trade. She cried 
when I said, you don't have to listen to the grumpy old fart who's not doing, he drove her to do it. But she, again, she had the choice. Yes. And she could have said, actually, let's take advice on this instead of listening to that grumpy old fart in the front row. I mean, I'm calling him a fart because I'm trying to watch my language because we tr try to avoid an explicit rating for basket case clubs. And that's, it's that sort of prick yep. that would make me say, mm. And another great example of a, a, an individual who in her professional life uses great efficient systems and makes business minded decisions, but because it saves time and time is money. So it makes sense. There you go. Not but, realizing that time isn't money when it's time, but you can't buy it back. Mm -hmm. it's, it's far gone. more valuable than money. That's far right. more valuable than money. So of all of the people that we should be trying to save time or mandating that we're saving time by looking yeah. for systems, yeah, it's volunteers. So systems is another great in for finding where we can buy back time and spending a little bit of money. I'm also going to say outsourcing because very mm. often, so I used to service my own car. My first car, you won't believe this, but it was red. It was a red VC Commodore. Real, have you ever had a non-red car? I had a maroon one. <laughs> maroon, burgundy, cream, the white, the off-white, the ivory or the beige. Yeah. yeah. No, it was red. And it look, it was so simple. Like I could actually change the starter motor on the yeah. side of the road, pull the extractors off. I broke far too many tappet covered bolts. But it was easy to do. Yeah. But the cars after that with the computers, I went, you know what? I'm not going to service my own car yep. because it takes it will take me far too long and I'll have to invest in a whole heap of extra equipment and machinery that I don't have. Yep. And it's not going to be as safe if I try yep. and replace the, the rotors in my front. Get the experts wheels. to do it. Just get the experts to do it. Yep. What parts of club operations are... Look, and I, while I support the concept of a working bee, mm. is it really the best use of those volunteers' time? So you, depending what, on the nature of the activity, it can be if it's cleaning up your equipment, tidying it up at the end of or in preparation for a season. And right. then having a social get together afterwards. Capitalising on the social engagement Absolutely. opportunity that it yeah. presents. Excellent. If it's building a retaining wall, particularly if it's above a metre in height, definitely not. Yep. Get the professionals yep. to do it and yep. do it right. Yeah. So again, so that can also be the catalyst to say, mm. so are we putting extra stress on our volunteers mm. Or are we potentially putting them in a position of liability should the retaining wall fail and hurt or kill somebody? Yeah. So good good choice. And But again, it's just that's the catalyst. That's the, oh, now we're looking at this. We've system holding each other to account, looking in the mirror. I'm going to give you another example which relates to the support that we provide to clubs. So this is not one which relates to the potential failing of a retaining wall, which will lead to injury or worse. Uh, but we had... Um, presented a proposal to work with a golf club on a new constitution. And it was through our partnership with the governing body. So the club was going to get a significantly uh, reduced investment that, that it was going to require for them to get our support. They said, no, we can do it ourselves. Thank you. We, we appreciate that you could do a great job, but we think we can do a fine job. So they embarked upon the review of their constitution. So it's 2024, Steve. Was this about 2000, 2001? No, it was only, it, admittedly, it was two years ago okay. that, that that went down. And then earlier this year, so 18 months later, they came to a workshop that I was running in, in far north Queensland, which is where the club's based. And the two lovely ladies who I get on very well with turned up and we got into the session and we started talking about constitutions and it became apparent pretty early from the questions that they were asking that they had not yet completed their review. We then got around during and following the workshop to having a discussion about how it was going and what support they might need. It came to light that only the Friday prior to this Wednesday, let's say it was, so a few days earlier, both of them had made the conscious decision to not go and play golf which is why they got involved in their golf club, right? They're both in their 80s, so they should be making really sound decisions as to how they're going to spend their time in the context of today's discussion. And they were they were lamenting the fact that they'd had to not play golf because they were working on the constitution. So we then discussed the value of volunteer time and multiplied each of their investment of time to date on the constitution by the let's say forty five dollars odd per hour, you know that volunteer in Australia, is way too conservative, which I think is reality. way too conservative yep, for that sort of work. And of course, the calculation resulted in a figure which by far outweighed what the club would have had to invest in our support. Needless to say, uh, 
they made the decision after that to go and play golf the following <laughs> Friday and to get our help finishing the constitution. And of course, we started again <laughs> and, and wrote them a new one with which they are now very, very happy. But this is a really recent example. And in the grand scheme of things, it happened. Oh, it actually happened as a result. It actually it happened. Governance sorted. And as well as them making the decision to not go and play golf, it was hanging over their heads. They were concerned about doing it right. They were worried about including provisions that weren't going to be approved by the regulatory body when they submitted the document after its adoption by the members. Absolutely leading themselves down a path of unnecessary angst. Yep. So there's a really practical recent example. And, and we hear this sort of thing all the time. Mm. And and if if, if we want to, we've, we've just taken on a lease for a second office. We didn't write our own lease agreement. No. We went and paid the experts who do a really good job of that day in, day out to do so. Well, we didn't paint the walls. We could have painted the walls. We could have painted the walls. But if we paint the walls that Saturday, that's a workshop that you can't go and help volunteers and it's a workshop I can't go and help volunteers. So we went and helped volunteers. Dan painted the walls. Yep. It makes sense. Yep. So to wrap up, Steve, I would like to finish on a note that is probably, well, it can be as sombre as that with which we started. So let me start there. If you're a volunteer and you're at the point of experiencing some level of burnout, if it was you that was getting put into the ground this afternoon, the club would find a way. The club would go on. So everything that you think that you are doing, that is you you are uniquely indispensable. Mm. Let this be a wake up call. You're not. <laughs> Everyone's the same. And if it was you that was going down into the ground this afternoon, the club would go on. Life will go on and it will go on without you. So if you are cracking the shit so much, you're saying, how can I get out? The flip side of that is, if if you if you're a gambler and you buy a ticket in the lotto and your numbers come up and you all of a sudden have a bank account with eight figures in it or nine figures in it, you know, yeah. ten or a hundred million dollars, mm-hmm. are you still going to be working your ass off at the club, mm. or are you going to find a nice little island out there near Richard Branson's and go and be island buddies with Sir Dick? And will and will you put Probably some? Nobody's of- ever called him Sir Dick. <laughs> So, sorry, Richard Branson. I don't think he's called himself so, Dick. <laughs> um, or, and would you put some of that money towards the payment of people who can do the work instead of volunteers at your club? Because I reckon there's a pretty good chance. If you've got a yeah. million in the bank and yep. you love the club as much as you do to have been nearing burnout. Yep, yep. So consider those opportunities to take that step even before you've got that windfall. Yeah, positive. So... Yes, you can die tomorrow, you can die today, or yes, you could win the lotto, or have some other windfall that says, this is a great opportunity for reconnecting with family in Melbourne, and you've got to move away, reconnecting with family in Darwin, or, or a job opportunity in Perth, and you, and you take it, mm. and you have to leave. The club will find a way. Yep. Why don't you find a way now? Why don't you make your job better now? There you go. There's always an upside, Steve. Thank you very much. Of course, if you're not already connected with us on social media, find us on LinkedIn, uh, connect to us on our website, cprgroup.com.au, where you can get our regular newsletter. And of course, there's uh, access to all of our, our free webinars that we do, uh, further information about our the things that we do to help people like you, then jump on and connect with us. And of course, if you want to pick up the phone, our phone number is there. And we, we always love a chat. Can you believe that? We always love a chat. Yeah. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> Steve, thank you again. This has been good. Thanks, Mick. See you next Cathartic. time. See ya. Bye. Basket Case Clubs acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country on which we record, being Yugambir, Tarabal, Jagera, and Kabi Kabi land. We recognise their enduring connection to land, waters and culture and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to First Nations listeners.